Ladies and gentlemen, the Shred Gaming Center.com video, we're going to be discussing hyper threading, which of course is generally considered to be an Intel technology. Now, we're going to be discussing this because someone asked me to do a video on it, so I figured might as well. And it's actually a fairly old piece of technology. Um, it was originally implemented way back in 2002 in both the Xenon processors, which are of course are primarily for servers, as well as the Pentium 4 for desktops. So Intel claims up to 30% plus extra performance, and it really does depend on the application. We will talk about this in just a moment, but the brief overview is... If a processor supports hyper-threading, it heavily depends on which processor that is and just how many threads that the program can handle, as well as other pieces of information such as, for example, what's the amount of cache on the CPU um, and, of course, the rest of system resources as well. So let's talk briefly about what actually hyper-threading is. Now, the main thing that we need to understand is that hyper-threading is not the same as, for example, oh, let's say a multi-core CPU, right? Because you can have a multi-core CPU, such as the i7, which can handle hyper-threading as well. Now, to understand what hyper-threading is, we're going to give you a very brief overview of exactly how it works, and that is the processors can only handle and we're talking about regular CPUs here. They can only handle one instruction per core at a time. So in other words, think of it as a queue, right? So let's assume that you're, I don't know, getting tickets to go see a movie. You can imagine that each person has to be assigned a queue at once, right? It's not the same as everyone gets a turn. So imagine a second kiosk opens. Think of that as another core. Right, so in which case two people could be served simultaneously. This is very different from, say, a Sim D architecture on a graphics card. So, uh, but that's a completely different topic. So I just wanted to really clarify that and put like a wall there in your mind so you understand the differences. So, in this respect, even if you have a single core processor, say way back when, say 2000 and odd, when most desktops, most laptops only had a single core processor and you may remember that you may have say had an Outlook open, you might have had say internet, an internet browser of some description open, you might have even been playing a game and to you it seems like your processor is let's say multitasking, you are multitasking, your, pro your computer is multitasking, but in reality each one is just taking up a slice, a section of CPU time and it's simply executing those instructions within a set period of time. So let's assume, uh, let's just make this really easy to visualize and let's say um, that you have a graph of 100% right and this is within a second so let's assume that you're playing a game and that game takes like 80% of the resources. So you could say 80% of the CPU time is being taken by the game. That means that each second uh, the game is taking up 80% of the queue time, 80% of the 80% of the line, if you will, is being taken up by the game. The rest, for example, your web browser or whatever. Hopefully that gives you a basic understanding how this works. Now to you. It doesn't really feel like there's any delay at all. It doesn't think it doesn't feel like there's any latency. It feels like it's smooth runnings. So the reality of the matter is, however, there's always a delay. There's multiple reasons for this. It could be, um, let's say, it's an out of order processor. So in other words, data is sent um, and can be much better retrieved, and it doesn't have to rely so much on the way it was compiled. Even so. Let's say it's getting piece of mem uh, piece of data from the memory, or let's assume that it has to wait for another instruction to be processed. Meanwhile, there's a lot of instances where the CPU is literally just going la di da di da. So in actuality, when you're starting to switch between these different applications and the processors um, starting to handle each of these applications different threads, there's a delay. So Assume, for example, that we go back to the ticket booth, right? Uh, the ticket booth scenario. Now, 
Assume that you are imagining there are two different lines with two different kiosks. So there's kiosk A and we'll call it kiosk B. You and your friends are chilling, you know, you go to each of the lines, you know, you go to line A, they go to line B, and you're served. And it, it, it's smoother, right? It's much faster, obviously, because in this case, it's the equivalent of having two processors. It's much faster, each person gets a turn. But there's always delays. There's always that person in line when they say, well, yes, sir, it's 8.52. And you know that person's going to be like, I know I've got change here somewhere. And they're, you know, rummaging through their wallet or their purse or whatever. And they're like, okay, here's five and one, two, and you're just waiting and waiting. Isn't it frustrating? So technically speaking, that kiosk is doing a bupkus. They're just waiting. So imagine hyper-threading in our imaginary world is the equivalent of saying there's a second window on the other side of the kiosk. So in actuality there are two lines. Now it doesn't necessarily, so in other words the lines diverge into two. So let's say you get into line A but now it becomes 1A and and uh, and 2A. So in, think about it that that line now splits up and it goes either side of the kiosk. So it's still the same person, it's still you know Bill who's serving you both on both sides of the line, but the difference is while he's waiting for that person who's fumbling with the change, he can just turn over and handle the other um, the other person who's now at the kiosk. So it's much smoother. So while one's waiting to pay, the other person can be scanned in. Hopefully that gives you a basic understanding and a kind of layman's terms. Now, for all intents and purposes, if you own a hyper-threading processor and you look at Tasks Manager, and you notice the thread count. You will notice, for example, let's say it's uh, an i7, you will notice eight threads. But, and this is the important part, it's not eight CPU cores. You have basically four virtual CPUs or four logical CPUs. Now, hyperthreading is basically created by duplicating certain little sections of the processor. But it's not those which actually um, the, uh, actually execute or um, the main execution resources. So in other words, it can store a lot more stuff, but it can't execute it so efficiently as, say, a, a, multi a multi core design. Now, of course, there are some requirements here, including that your process, uh, so that your operating system must support it, and they do. So. I've answered roughly what it is, um, and it's really a great example of what is known as super scalar architecture, which, to put it mildly, is basically multiple structures uh, operating in parallel. So it's kind of like parallelism. So multiple pieces of data all kind of uh, all working at the same time, and it does this by each clock cycle it will send multiple instructions to a unit of the processor that isn't doing anything. This is actually very similar to how modern SIMD, SIMD pro, uh, GPUs work as well. Um, so multiple of the little cores inside, say, the GCNs of, the say, the Radeons or the PlayStation 4s, they will come together and whichever one of them is free, they will help to execute a certain task. Apologies if this sounds a bit broken up, it's really hard to kind of explain some of this really technical stuff in a in a way which is both interesting to people who know about it and also trying to um, explain it to those who are not quite so familiar. Anyway, so the purpose of it is uh, to improve performance and to make better use of resources that are of course finite I'm sorry on a CPU. So the big question is um, is it worth the cash, right? So for example, is an i5 better than an i7 or an i7 better than an i5? Should you should you go for hyper threading if you're a gamer? Should you avoid it? Well this is going to sound a little bit of a cop-out, but it really depends on the application. 
a lot of games actually aren't that well equipped to deal with multi-threading. There are games which are becoming better at it. Crisis 3, for example, um, and there are certainly others which are taking much better advantage of multi-core, but a lot don't. Another fact to, con to consider is it also depends on what graphics card you've got. For example, most games are typically GPU bound, not all. Let's just make a system up. Um, let's say that you've got plenty of RAM in there, but let's not worry about the amount of RAM. And let's say that you're not RAM bound. Let's say you've got 16 gigs. And let's assume that you have a high-end Ivy Bridge processor or Haswell processor. Let's say you've got a 477T, a 4770K, right? So that's a very high-end processor. It handles multi-threading. But let's assume that you have a crummy graphics card or a lower-end graphics card. Let's assume it's not a crummy graphics card by any means, but it's not something you'd want to pair with that type of CPU. Let's assume you've got something like a Radeon 7850. It's a very good card, it's very powerful, but it's not going to take full advantage of that CPU. And let's also further make an assumption that you are going to be playing at 1080p. Most likely, you're not even in a multi-core game, even even if the game does support uh, up to 8 threads, especially if it's graphically intensive, you're not really going to have any you know, problems um, with the CPU because the GPU is simply not going to be able to keep up, also known as GPU bound. The graphics card simply cannot draw things as fast as what the CPU can process. However, let's assume that you have exactly the same uh, CPU, let's assume that you have exactly the same amount of memory, but let's assume that you have a high-end graphics card. Let's assume you have something like, oh, I don't know, the GTX 680, or even the new Radeon R9 290X, which of course is coming out sometime this month. To put that into perspective, that is 5.6 T-flops of computing power with the Radeon that I just mentioned. And, you know, any of the high-end GPUs now are like 40 flops plus, and that's not counting SLI or Crossfire, where, in fact, you're basically doubling the GPU performance, right? So, in theory, you can have like 8, 10 or so T-flops of computing power. In which case, you're probably going to have situations where the GPU itself could possibly, with a lower-end CPU, be waiting for instructions. And this especially is the case um, with inefficiencies on low-level, or should I say, higher-level APIs such as DirectX. Regardless, for most gamers, um, from tests, most games don't benefit that heavily right now from hyperthreading. I would probably say that most of you will not need hyperthreading if you're a gamer. If you're just a pure gamer and you want an Intel machine, remember this is not the same for AMDs. AMD machines are very different. They don't actually have traditional hyperthreading with say the FX8350. Um, they actually has a duplication of, they have actual multiple execution units, but the way the resources are divided are very different. It's not hyperthreading. So the question is, if you are a gamer, do you need hyperthreading? Most likely, no. But you should check to see the games that you are interested in. However, most likely, especially if you're building on a fairly you know, reasonable budget, you'd probably be better to spend that extra, I don't know what it is in dollars, I'll just be completely honest, but in the UK you're looking at about 80 to 100 pounds, depending entirely on where you buy, what model you're going for, whether it's unlocked and so on and so on. But you're looking at anything between, you know, 70 to 100 pounds difference between, say, the i7 and the i5. Um, and honestly speaking, if you're building on a fairly reasonable budget, you're probably better off to pile that into a GPU, you're going to get much better performance. On the other hand, if you are building a high-end rig, for example, for video editing, then you're probably going to want to heavily consider hyperthreading.
because as for performance it really does depend on the application it heavily depends on how many threads that application can handle and so I can't give you an exact figure because it really does um, depend on the ex exact app I would google it I would google something like let's assume that you are looking for program A you would google program A with and then type in the processors you are considering and then look at the benchmarks on them because hyperthreading really does vary from application to application because some apps simply physically cannot address more than say two or four threads on the other hand high-end creative applications such as say Adobe After Effects, Adobe Premiere, Photoshop, um, 3D rendering applications as well they will basically all pretty much take as many threads as they can be given so in which case you're probably better off to go with hyperthreading Hopefully that's answered your question. I know that's really going about it in a really long-winded way, but I wanted to really clarify this because there seems to be some confusion over it. Anyway, I'm going to get going. Hopefully you found it a somewhat informative video. I'm going to uh, record some more stuff, so I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.